Hello everyone. I am Dr. Supriya Kulkarni. Welcome to Medical Queen's Got Talent founded by Dr. Jaya Daftardar. Medical Queen's Got Talent is celebrating women by offering health and wellness talks by healthcare experts. We are focusing on women's health equity, raising awareness of the issues impacting women all over the world. Hope these talks will help educate them and provide resources and information to use and overcome their health and well-being related issues. These talks are only for educational purposes. So today I am going to talk to you about a topic which is very near and dear to my heart. I am a practicing endocrinologist in the state of Connecticut in the United States. Uh, I work at Middlesex Hospital in Middletown, Connecticut. Um, I have been um, practicing for thyroid disorders for over a decade now, and hence this topic is very near and dear to my heart. I've seen several thousands of patients who have thyroid disorders and help them. Um, so let's um, start this journey and uh, please take a seat back and enjoy as well as um, get more information and education from this um, thyroid disorders talk. So thyroid gland is a very important structure in human body. The thyroid gland is located here at the base of your neck, which is right here in front of the clavicles, in front of the windpipe, the trachea. Above it lies the uh, voice box, that is the larynx. The thyroid gland is a very small gland, about 10 to 20 grams in weight, and it has two lobes, the right lobe and left lobe, which are connected by the connecting piece or the isthmus. Each lobe is about three to five centimeters in size, and the isthmus is three to five millimeters in size. Even though the gland is very small in size, but the functions that the gland carries out in our system, in our human body, are very um, powerful and impact many organs in the body. So let's um, let's talk a little bit about thyroid hormone synthesis. How does thyroid hormone get formed inside the thyroid gland? So the thyroid gland takes up iodine molecule and in turn, it produces two hormones that is T4 and T3. This is a very complex intracellular process that goes on into making these two hormones. T3 has three iodine molecules and T4 has four iodine molecules. The um, T4 is the abundant form of thyroid hormone in humans. T3 is produced in very small quantities. Both hormones are carried via bloodstream to all organs. It is important to remember that iodine and selenium are required elements for functioning of the enzymes required for thyroid hormone synthesis. How is thyroid hormone secretion regulated in human body? So it is regulated with this master gland, that's the pituitary gland that's located inside our brain here in behind our forehead. The um, hypothalamus is a part of the brain that secretes a factor called TRH or thyroid resistance hormone. It in turn goes to the pituitary and produces, pituitary gland produces something called TSH that stands for thyroid stimulating hormone. The thyroid stimulating hormone tells the thyroid gland to produce the hormones T4 and T3. When T4 and T3 are present in abundance, then these hormones via negative feedback mechanism will downregulate or will inhibit the pituitary and in turn the hypothalamus. So this is how this loop of negative feedback works. And this is very important to know so that we can understand some of the disorders affecting the thyroid gland. And we can also understand how doctors interpret the hormones and the test results, which tell us what disorder you have. The functions of thyroid hormone are myriad. As I said before, thyroid hormone impacts every cell in your body. Um, it, in, the most important functions are, it impacts your basal metabolic rate. That means how fast or how slow you burn calories. It is also important in the first stages of your life when the follicle and embryo development or infertility, um, fetal brain development is very important. Then it also affects our thermostat, the body's temperature regulation, affecting how much your body temperature is cold or hot. Then it affects the rate at which the food moves through our digestive tract. It affects your heartbeats. Um, it affects the growth. 
it affects the muscle function it affects the reproductive function so it as it you know you see there are many more impacts of the thyroid hormone all over the body and it is very important to know what thyroid hormone does to us in health so that we know what happens in disease what symptoms you can get if the system does not function properly what are the types of thyroid disorders i'm going to discuss the most common thyroid disorders in details and i'm also going to go through a few questions that are regularly asked by all all my patients as well as a few myths and the correct facts so thyroid hormone or thyroid gland disorders can be um classified into different types one is hypothyroidism that is underactive thyroid hyperthyroidism that is an overactive thyroid goiter is nothing but swollen or enlarged thyroid gland um then comes thyroid nodules which are small lumps found on the thyroid gland and last but not the least is thyroid cancer so what are the general risk factors for thyroid disorders who do you think gets the thyroid disorders most as we all know thyroid disorders are more common in women for some reason and the common risk factors for developing thyroid disease is one is age of course you know as we go grow older we tend to get a lot of other disorders so similarly thyroid disorders also become more common with progressing age if you are overweight or obese from childhood or from adolescence or young adulthood there's a ch high chance that you may develop a thyroid condition smoking is considered one of the major risk factors for thyroid disease the next one is genetic susceptibility if parent or any um, close family members have certain thyroid disorders then it is more likely that the offspring can have the same or the spectrum of the um, conditions the other autoimmune conditions if you already have some other autoimmune disorders say lupus or rheumatoid arthritis or type 1 diabetes addison's disease there are so many of them celiac disease gluten sensitivity then you are at more risk of developing thyroid disorder as well um then next one is radiation treatment to the thyroid area or to the neck in the olden days they used to um, use radiation treatment for variety of common medical conditions for instance treatment of acne was by radiation treatment and if you receive a lot of radiation or if you are exposed to any radioactive substances or radiation in the form of cancer treatment radiation um a lot younger in your life there are chances that you may develop thyroid disorders later on in life and last but not the least is iodine deficiency as well as iodine surplus can cause thyroid problems so you need to just have the right amount of iodine in your body let's first take the hypothyroidism under discussion hypothyroidism is nothing but underactive thyroid let's go over the prevalence that is extremely common condition worldwide we all know that one in five women can have hypothyroidism at some stage in their life what are the causes of hypothyroidism symptoms of hypothyroidism what how we diagnose it how do doctors interpret your lab results and what is the treatment for it so let's see these things one by one what are the causes of hypothyroidism if you look at worldwide common causes the most common cause comes out as iodine deficiency in the united states or in many other developed countries now the salt has been iodized so and there is lot of iodine in other food items that we eat um, have been fortified with iodine so in the united states and some other developed nations iodine deficiency is not the common cause of thyroid disorder but still worldwide it is one of the common causes and the next common cause which is mo the most common in the united states is autoimmune disease of the thyroid gland which in layman term people call it hashimotos disease or hashimotos thyroiditis that is nothing but your own immune system produces antibodies or some produces some chemicals that is called torpedoes or antibodies which react with your thyroid and cause slow destruction of the gland leading to hypothyroidism at some point in your life the next one is surgery if your if your thyroid gland has been removed surgically then automatically you develop hypothyroidism if your thyroid gland has received any kind of radiation treatment um like radioactive iodine treatment for certain forms of thyroid disease that we are going to see later you can develop hypothyroidism because of the radiation um sometimes people of you know some children are born with it that is called congenital hypothyroidism therefore tsh is one of the newborn screening tests everyone who is born in the united states and now you know it's followed worldwide it gets screened for a variety of disorders tsh that is hypothyroidism is one of them 
some medications can cause hypothyroidism. Most commonly, it is caused by antithyroid drugs that we treat, use to treat for the hyperthyroidism conditions. Then other common um, uh, causes or drug-related hypothyroidism we see commonly in patients using lithium. Um, newer drugs are coming for uh, coming out for cancer treatment. That is, cancer immunotherapy specifically can lead to a lot of endocrine problems. Thyroid being one of them. Um, another drug which is commonly used by cardiologists called amiodarone for stabilization of your heart rhythm that can cause hypothyroidism as well. So these are the common drugs that can cause hypothyroidism. Lastly, um, but not the least, damage to your pituitary gland, which is the master endocrine gland, can also cause hypothyroidism because if you do not have enough TSH from the pituitary, then the thyroid gland per se does not know what to do, and hence you develop hypothyroidism. So these are the common causes. There are many other causes, but they are very rare uh, and beyond the scope of this topic. There is a um, condition, everyone asks me when I put them on thyroid hormone supplementation, am I going to need this lifelong or is it going to be transient? Am I going to need it for just a few weeks or months? So there is an entity called transient hypothyroidism. What is it? Is It occurs after a bout of subacute thyroiditis, like post-viral thyroiditis or postpartum, that is after delivery in the postpartum period, women can develop thyroiditis. Thyroiditis is nothing but inflammation of the gland. So it initially leads to hyperthyroidism because the gland becomes so swollen, so inflamed that it becomes leaky. All the thyroid hormone that is formed inside the gland is suddenly released into the bloodstream. Then for, this is followed by an empty thyroid gland because there's no hormone synthesis, new hormone synthesis going on because the gland is still inflamed. And then once the thyroid gland restores its function, the inflammation resolves, the swelling goes down, then slowly and steadily the thyroid hormone repletion or the function starts coming back. So there are a certain uh, group of patients who may need the thyroid hormone treatment for only a few weeks or a month or less than a year. These are the patients who have transient hypothyroidism due to thyroiditis. What are the symptoms and signs of hypothyroidism? This is very important because um, this is how a, a person would know if they have any thyroid conditions or not. So thyroid hormone impacts a lot of functions in the body. That's why the symptoms are very nonspecific. They are a lot of symptoms. And you know, every, per, every individual, every patient may not have all the symptoms. You can have a combination. You can have a few. And honestly speaking, um, some a, a few uh, patients can be totally asymptomatic as well. So what are the common symptoms? Um, let's start from top to bottom. There could be thinning of hair or excessive hair loss is a common symptom. We get loss of eyebrow hair. Can we, can we get puffy face, um, enlarged thyroid gland, um, skin becomes dry and coarse. Your heartbeat becomes slow. When you go to the doctor's office, they can tell you that your heart is very slow running. Um, you can get constipation. Uh, appetite is very poor. Women can get irregular periods, um, heavy menstruation, um, infertility in people who are, you know, with women who are trying to get pregnant. That could be one of the presenting factors. Cold sensitivity or freezing um, arms and legs, swelling of the arms and legs. They can develop um, weight gain because your metabolic rate slows down. Some other symptoms could be a lack of um, concentration, poor memory, um, constantly feeling tired and fatigued and listless and just not able to function properly um, are some of the common symptoms when the thyroid gland does not produce enough thyroid hormone. So how do we diagnose hypothyroidism? This is basically diagnosed by simple blood tests. So the tests that we order commonly are, of course, a serum TSH, that is a blood TSH level. In hypothyroidism, the TSH is high because the thyroid gland is sluggish. It is not producing enough hormones of T4 and T3. That is why the pituitary gland has to work harder and tell the thyroid gland to produce hormones. So the TSH goes up. The T4 can be normal or it can be low. T3 or total T3 can be normal or low. In patients who have Hashimoto's thyroiditis as the reason or the cause for hypothyroidism, we often find positive PPO, that is thyroid peroxidase, and thyroglobulin antibodies. This is one of the ways that doctor can tell you that you have Hashimoto's thyroiditis. Um, 
in patients who have pituitary problems specifically their tsh will be low their t4 and t3 will be low obviously because the pituitary is not functioning well that's why the thyroid is sluggish so both glands become sluggish in cases where the primary problem lies with the thyroid gland the thyroid gland is sluggish but the pituitary has to work harder so tsh goes up t4 t3 can be normal or can be found low so these are the common tests and then interpretation of those tests that tells your doctor that you have hypothyroidism how do we treat it um so treatment is actually very simple it is lifelong replacement with a medication called levothyroxine or levothyroxine is nothing but synthetic t4 so there are certain synthetic preparations containing thyroid hormone and there are certain natural preparations um containing thyroid hormone so the synthetic preparations that contain predominantly and only t4 that is thyroid t4 hormone are it could be generic is levothyroxine that's the most commonly prescribed drug and the brand names for it could be synthroid tyrosine levoxyl euthyrox there are several companies which pre produce brand thyroid hormones then you could have t3 containing drugs only isolated t3 these are all synthetic preparations produced and manufactured in the factory but with the chemical formulation and the sequence same as human t3 and human t4 hormones so the generic t3 is called lyothyronine and brand is cytomel what are the natural preparations natural preparations are derived from pigs thyroid tissues and they contain varying proportions of t4 and t3 because lower animals produce t3 as well as t4 both inside their thyroid gland in humans the thyroid gland produces predominantly t4 and then that t4 gets converted into t3 inside the tissues or inside the organs and it is a very complex finely regulated system containing some enzymes that convert the t4 to t3 so t3 is the active form of the hormone and t4 is the pro hormone but in humans we produce t4 inside the thyroid and t3 inside the cells of the tissues like heart muscles or you know skeletal muscles inside the liver inside the brain cells that's where you find the t3 not in the blood commonly but in pigs or in other lower animals you find t3 and t4 both circulating in the blood the examples of natural thyroid hormones are armor thyroid wp thyroid or nature thyroid some of the treatment considerations is is very important to know that thyroid medication should be taken on empty stomach it is very peculiar medication you have to take it in the proper fashion in order to derive the maximum benefit from it it is taken on empty stomach first thing in the morning and you have to separate it from any food or drink by at least 1 hour it is also ideal to separate it from other medications if you are on if you are taking some other um, non prescription or prescription medications you should separate them from the thyroid medicine by at least 1 hour if you are taking iron or calcium supplements or you are taking any other hormonal preparations you should separate them from the thyroid medicine by at least 4 hours then uh, this is a common question we get is brand better than generic and most cases 99% of the cases we find that generic and brand work equally better they are equivalent um thyroid medicine it is important to know that it is a long acting medication it requires almost 6 to 8 weeks to reach a steady state concentration so the patient does not feel start feeling better overnight it takes a slow process and you know overall after 6 to 8 weeks we test the blood um to see if you uh, your levels are therapeutic and if your levels are therapeutic that's great we continue the same dose of the thyroid medication that we put you on initially or if the levels are still on the low side that is a tsh is high t4 t3 are low then we adjust the dose of the medication so this is how the process goes is by regular monitoring of the blood and adjusting the dosage until we find good results so um it is important for all of you to know that biotin is a supplement health supplement that many women many patients take for hair skin nails growth and biotin can interfere with the thyroid lab results so it is important to stop all biotin containing products for at least 3 to 5 days before taking the blood tests for thyroid hormone 
people who have any other malabsorption conditions, like you had stomach surgery, like gastric bypass surgery, or a part of your intestine stomach was removed because of surgery. If you have another condition for the kidneys called nephrotic syndrome, if you are pregnant, then your doses, you require higher than usual doses. And it requires regular monitoring to find out whether it's a good dose or not. So these are some of the common treatment considerations to be kept in mind. What are the myths about hypothyroidism? These are very common questions that I get a lot in the office. Um, you know, there are there's a lot out there on the internet, and a um, lot of it are myths. And uh, what I am telling you is from the um, textbooks of endocrinology and the um, American Thyroid Association guidelines. So please follow that. Um, it, they say that you know, myth is you cannot eat cruciferous vegetables. Cruciferous vegetables like cauliflower, cabbage, broccoli, etc. Um, actually speaking, you have to eat tons and tons of cruciferous vegetables every single day. Like, you know, you have to eat five pounds of broccoli every day in order to get thyroid dysfunction from broccoli. I mean, from cruciferous vegetables alone. So ideally, and nobody eats that much. So ideally, that's not a common cause. And you know, it is very important to eat moderate quantities of cruciferous vegetables in your diet. They are a part of your well-balanced diet. So there's no reason to avoid cruciferous vegetables if you have thyroid condition. And especially so if you're already on treatment for thyroid condition, then there's no point in um, refraining from eating these healthy health foods. Um, second myth is you cannot lose weight if you have thyroid problem. Part of it could be correct. If your thyroid problem is not treated properly. It is not treated with a therapeutic level. Yes, you may have difficulty losing weight, but once your thyroid hormone treatment is appropriate, your thyroid levels in the circulating in the blood are completely normal, then the weight gain or the inability to lose weight is not associated with your thyroid. So then try harder with lifestyle modifications to if you in order to lose weight. Um, all patients who have hypo Hashimoto's thyroiditis should eat gluten-free. So again, that is also not correct. Patients with Hashimoto's thyroiditis can have other autoimmune conditions. Specifically, if you have celiac disease, then you should have gluten-free diet. But if you do not have a formal diagnosis of celiac disease, there's no use to restrict gluten from your diet. Um, if you are having problems of your GI symptoms, that is bloating, diarrhea, um, not feeling well after eating gluten, then maybe you can cut down on the gluten, um, you know, gluten intake. But otherwise, just having Hashimoto's thyroiditis or hypothyroidism for any reason should not be the reason to cut out gluten completely from your diet. Then um, next is, can you please change my dose? Can you please give me a little more? I don't feel well. My TSH you know, is still um, two or my TSH is one. I don't feel well. I want my TSH as low as possible. So please give me more thyroid hormone. And um, taking extra thyroid hormone is not going to give you more energy. We, we tell everyone that thyroid hormone preparation or thyroid hormone is not a registered weight loss medications or it is not a registered energy boost medication. It is only supposed to replace the dysfunction of your thyroid, just supposed to replace the lost thyroid hormones in your blood. Uh, but rest of the date should be evaluated by a medical professional for some other causes that could be causing the low energy. Um, and secondly, you know, thyroid disease is very easy to treat. No, actually, it's very complex. You, know, you have to take it every individual by individual basis and see what works and what doesn't work for every patient. Um, okay, so now let's go over hyperthyroidism, that is overactive thyroid. What are the causes of hyperthyroidism? Again, autoimmune diseases, namely Graves' disease or Hashitoxicosis is one of the common causes of hyperthyroidism, that is overactive thyroid. Um, it could be come from a toxic nasal, that is lumps in the thyroid that have developed a mind of its own, and it is causing production of thyroid hormones in high numbers. It can be caused by thyroiditis, that is inflammation. When the gland is inflamed, it, it suddenly releases a gush of thyroid hormones into your bloodstream. So in the initial phase of thyroiditis, you can have hyperthyroidism. And this thyroiditis, that is inflammation of the gland, can be provoked by um, certain viruses, upper respiratory illnesses. COVID virus was one of the very common causes we have seen leading to thyroiditis, flu viruses, um, then it could be caused by certain drugs like radio contrast agents, iodine-induced thyroiditis, 
um, amiodarone has a lot of iodine in it, so it can cause thyroiditis or hyperthyroidism. Pregnancy hormones can lead to um, hyperthyroidism. Certain cancers, specifically ovarian and breast cancers, very rarely can cause production of T4, that is uh, ectopic um, production of the thyroid hormones and causing hyperthyroidism. Um, extremely rare cause is a uh, pituitary tumor. If you have a pituitary tumor that produces high quantities of TSH, then your thyroid is going to become overactive. And last but not the least is overuse of thyroid medications. There are so many um, you know, products available over the counter in vitamin shoppies, GNC, thyroid support, energy booster, metabolism support, weight loss pill. And we don't know exact contents, but some, some of the preparations can have iodine or some of the preparations can have actual thyroid hormone in it, um, which is not put on the label or the ingredient list. And that can cause hyperthyroidism. We've seen so many cases with abnormal thyroid labs. And if you take a detailed medical history, they come up with all these herbal supplements. And if you Google um, the contents of those herbal supplements, it often contains bovine thyroid or bovine pituitary that is from the, you know, from the cow's pituitary, cow's uh, thyroid gland or pig's thyroid gland. It can have those compositions. Um, and of course, prescription medications if you're taking um, a higher dose of levothyroxine, synthroid, or T3, um, or armor, then it can lead to hyperthyroidism. What are the symptoms of hyperthyroidism? It's exactly opposite of what you feel in hypothyroidism. Initially, you get a lot of energy, you feel active, you feel um, that you're losing a lot of weight, your metabolic rate goes up, but certain um, unpleasant symptoms are later on, it causes fatigue, it causes muscle weakness, you cannot sleep well, your heartbeat can become very rapid or irregular, that's called atrial fibrillation. You lose a lot of weight and start becoming emaciated because you lose a lot of bone and muscle mass inside. Initially, there's a lot of fat, loss of fat mass and people feel great, but then later you start losing muscle and bone and that causes the fatigue. Uh, and the, the extra weight loss, you become more nervous, you become more, mood becomes more irritable, you become more anxious or jittery. Um, there is increased sensi sensitivity to heat. So you're feeling um, um, heat and you're feeling um, sweaty and hot at all times. There could be mood swings, there could be tremors of your hands, um, there could be diarrhea or more frequent bowel movements. These are all the signs of um, hyperthyroidism. It can also affect fertility, cause irregular menstruation, it can cause a goiter, it can cause thinning of the skin. Another classic symptom of Graves' disease is bulging eyes that is called Graves' ophthalmopathy, in which the thyroid um, antibodies that are directed against the thyroid gland, they go and cross-react with the muscles around your eyes. And the muscles behind your eyeballs get swollen. If the muscles behind the eyeballs get swollen, there's not a lot of space in the orbits, so the eyes then bulge out. This condition is called Graves ophthalmopathy. This is a normal, the same person with a normal eye, um, eyes, and this is with the bulging eyes, which is a characteristic of Graves eye disease. What is the diagnosis of hyperthyroidism? Of course, when the thyroid gland has developed a mind of its own, it has taken over the function, then the T4 is going to be high, T3 is going to be high. Sometimes we find only T3 is high and T4 is normal, or T4 is high, T3 is normal, all combinations possible. But on an average, the thyroid gland is overproducing. So automatically, it sends the negative feedback impulses to the pituitary gland and the TSH from the pituitary gland gets suppressed. So the TSH is low and it gets suppressed and suppressed and suppressed as, as the thyroid gland function goes up and up and up. Um, certain antibodies we check for diagnosis of Graves' disease are called TSI, that is thyroid stimulating immunoglobulin, or TRAB, that is thyroid receptor antibodies. They can be positive in cases who have Graves' disease. We often resort to using thyroid ultrasound and radioactive iodine uptake and scan. These are two imaging tests that are useful in diagnosis of hyperthyroidism. Um, thyroid ultrasound usually shows that the gland is enlarged. It can show if there are any nodules in the gland. And of course, the gland is very vascular because it is overproducing, so it has a lot of blood vessels. Radioactive iodine uptake and scan shows high iodine uptake in patients who have Graves' disease. 
and very low uptake in patients who have thyroiditis. So it helps us distinguish, helps doctors, you know, tells doctors what is causing the hyperthyroidism. So these tests are very useful in diagnosis of hyperthyroidism. Um, I'm just giving you an ultrasound view of a normal looking thyroid gland. So this is your trachea. This is your skin, um, you know, of the skin of your um, neck. This is where your vertebrae are going to be and you're lying down facing this way. So this is your right thyroid lobe. This is your left thyroid lobe. This is the carotid artery on the right side, carotid artery on the left side. These are your neck muscles. That's your sternocleidomastoids that come um, you know, in front of the thyroid gland. And this is your skin. This is your trachea. That is a windpipe. So the thyroid gland sits caressing the windpipe and on both sides, connecting the connecting pieces, the isthmus. So this is a normal structure, normal homogeneous appearance of the gland and the lobes and the normal size of the gland. I've just blown up the picture for you to understand well. Normal thyroid gland is very tiny in size. So normal gland, um, it looks like this. In This is for vascularity. And the Graves' disease gland looks so much vascular. So if you see that on ultrasound, we can pinpoint if the patient has hyperthyroidism based on the vascularity of the gland. Radioactive iodine scan results. This is iodine is taken up by the thyroid gland in health and disease, both. So this is a normal uptake of thyroid of, of our iodine inside the thyroid gland. This is how a normal gland appears. And this is how a gland with Graves' disease appears. It is taking up a lot of iodine. It needs a lot of raw material because it's producing thyroid hormones in very high numbers. Um, so this scan, radioactive iodine scan, helps us diagnose the underlying cause of hyperthyroidism. All right, then come to, coming to treatment of hyperthyroidism, um, there are various modalities, like hypothyroidism is treated by one and all, that is levothyroxine, and that's the end of the story. But for hyperthyroidism, overactive thyroid, we have multiple options for treatment. The first and foremost, everybody gets started on is anti-thyroid drugs. Commonly used ones are methimazole. Methimazole is one of the most widely used common drugs as compared to PTU or propyl thiouracil. So we use methimazole as the first line treatment for treatment of hyperthyroidism. We again take the blood test um, in another four to five weeks or up to six weeks and then readjust the dose of methimazole. So this is how it goes on, is frequent, drug mon frequent lab monitoring followed by dose adjustment until the levels of the T4, T3 come back to the normal range and the patient starts feeling better. Um, so methimazole is one of the commonly used and first line medications. There are other modalities for treatment. One is radioactive iodine ablation and another one is total thyroidectomy, that is surgery. The iodine treatment and the um, surgery are permanent treatments. That means you cannot get your thyroid back after um, doing these treatment modalities. In radioactive iodine ablation, what we do is we attach radioactive substance to the iodine molecule. The patient takes the pill containing um, the radioactive iodine. The iodine is concentrated in the gland because as you already saw in Graves' disease, the gland is sucking up all the iodine from the blood. So it takes up all the iodine with the radioactivity attached to it. And that radiation, internal thyroid radiation will just destroy the gland slowly and lead to permanent destruction of the gland. So this is how the radioactive iodine treatment works. And surgery is surgery. The surgeon goes in and removes the gland in total. So overnight from hyperthyroidism, you're cured and you develop hypothyroidism overnight. Monitoring of therapy, as I said, every six to eight weeks, we check your TSH, PT4 and T3 levels. Then we adjust the dose of methimazole and then we recheck again in six to eight weeks and we keep monitoring the therapy. The methimazole is one of the medications which is usually very well tolerated by most of our patients, but a few patients, one in several thousand patients can develop a specific or a serious side effect of methimazole. That is why we do two additional tests for monitoring purpose. One is the CBC, which is complete blood count because the methimazole can rarely cause a sudden lowering of your white cell counts. White blood cells are your immune system, so it can make you more prone for infections if the white blood cell count goes down as a side effect of methimazole. So we always check a CBC periodically with the methimazole treatment. 
and liver functions. Methanosole can is known to affect the liver, but of course it's very rare side effect. Uh, but it is something that we can monitor. So we always check for LFT, that is liver function tests. So these are the two additional tests required for monitoring of therapy on methimazole. Next, coming to thyroid nasules. Thyroid nasule is nothing but lump um, on the gland. Any gland in the body can be lumpy, and so does thyroid gland. It's a very common um, condition that we see. They are caused by overgrowth of cells inside the gland. It's very common in general population. Actually, um, six out of 100 patients, you can, the doctor can feel a lump in the gland or you can, it, it could be easily visible as an enlarged gland or a lumpy gland um, from a distance. Um, actually, we know there are so many nodules that are very small in size, which cannot be examined um, on palpation but they could be detected on certain tests like an ultrasound. So ultrasound, if you were to do ultrasounds on 100 people walking on the streets, they were likely to find thyroid nodules of some size of shape and form in about 60 to 70 percent, 70 people out of those 100. Um, fortunately, majority of these nodules are benign. Cancer can be found approximately only five of 100 nodules. So it's not very common to find cancer in thyroid nodules. Majority of them are usually benign growths. But it is very important for a doctor to distinguish which nodule could be suspicious, which could be high risk for cancer, which one could be low risk for cancer. There are various types of nodules. One is the solid nodule, it's right here, solid nodule in the gland, cystic nodule, which is like a fluid filled cyst. And third is a mixed nodule that is like a um, solid and cystic components both. What are the high risk factors for cancer? So if we find nodules are very solid, they are um, darker than the rest of the gland, if they have irregular borders, if they are infiltrating outside the gland, if they are popping out outside the gland limits on an ultrasound, or if they have something called microcalcifications, um, those are all considered as high risk or high suspicion nodules. And these are the um, nodules that we select for biopsy. And the reason why we select them for biopsy is to find out if they are harboring thyroid cancer. So next comes thyroid cancer. Thyroid cancer could be of various shapes and forms. The most common type of thyroid cancer is papillary carcinoma of the thyroid. Next common is follicular carcinoma of the thyroid. And rare ones are anaplastic thyroid cancer and medullary thyroid cancer. These are different forms of thyroid cancer we see papillary carcinoma most often in our offices. What is the treatment? Thyroid cancer is most commonly treated with surgery. Surgery is curative in about 60 to 80% of the cases. Surgery alone and enough, and that's the treatment um, for very small microscopic papillary or microscopic follicular cancers. A few pa patients after surgery may need additional treatment and that is usually in the form that which is performed in the form of radioactive iodine ablation, in which we use a larger dose of radioactive iodine and destroy if there's any remnant microscopic thyroid remnant remaining behind after surgery. So that is the purpose of radioactive iodine ablation is to ablate the remaining thyroid tissue in the body. Um, if thyroid cancer, so you know, usually thyroid cancer is a, an indolent cancer, slow growing cancer, and there is a saying that people die with thyroid cancer and not from thyroid cancer. So in other words, thyroid cancer is not a very high cause for mortality, uh, but it is a, it is a um, cause for morbidity. You may need frequent monitoring, you may need frequent blood tests, you may need frequent surgeries if the cancer recurs back. So there are chances of recurrence. That's why long-term longitudinal monitoring and surveillance are very important. In a few subset of patients in, in whom the thyroid cancer is um, a very aggressive, has spread to distant organs, like if you have metastases to the lung, liver, um, bone, other endocrine organs, then you may need chemotherapy. And chemotherapy for thyroid cancer is in the form of pills called tyrosine kinase inhibitors. And we're extremely rarely, we use external beam that is actual radiation treatment can be used for metastatic thyroid cancer if it is metastasizing to the bones or if there is an external overgrowth involving your voice box or trachea, which we cannot solve. You know, we cannot live without a trachea. We cannot live without a voice box. 
Um, so if we cannot do a complete surgery, then external beam radiation can be used for local reasons. And I think with that, I will end my talk today. Um, this was an, a, an overview of thyroid disorders. Um, if you would like to have, know a, about anything specific in details, or if you have any additional questions, please contact me on my email. I have mentioned the email address here in my slide. And thank you very much for a patient listening. I hope you enjoyed it.